Hey everyone, welcome to Direct to Disaster. So this week I was going to review another VCR board game, but while I was visiting a local thrift store, I came across this. The late 70s saw the introduction of cartridge-based console systems. Pong consoles, or ancient plug-and-play games, were around before then, but they were limited to whatever games were built into them, mostly variations of, well, Pong. But with exchangeable cartridges, suddenly any game of any kind could be created and sold, with the only limits being what the console could process. Which, as we've seen with the Atari 2600, are very few. Suddenly, arcade classics such as Asteroids, Donkey Kong, Breakout, and Pac-Man could be played at home, while original games such as Pitfall, Adventure, and the Quest games showcased just what these consoles were capable of. They changed not only how we saw video games, but computers in general. And as more and more games were sold, other companies decided they wanted a piece of that pie. One of the earliest to catch on to the craze was the Magnavox Odyssey 2 in July 1978, less than a year after the Atari hit the market. Fans of the angry video game nerd are probably familiar with his review of the Odyssey game system, arguably the first home console ever made. Compared to all other consoles after this, this was as primitive as it got, with very clunky controllers, no graphics besides two or three white dots on the screen, and every game being two-player only. But it was a start, and it kicked off the gaming industry we know today. And thanks to good sales of this system and their later Pong consoles, they decided to enter the market with another cartridge-based machine, the cleverly named Odyssey 2. So today, we're going to look at this console, see how it compares to some other consoles at the time, and see if it's worth playing even today. First of all, look at this console! You thought the Xbox line was big? This thing's a monster! Look, it's bigger than any of my other gaming systems! And look at the face! Would you take one look at this thing and think, Oh yeah, it's a game console, I can tell right away. It looks more like an ancient computer. Or a typewriter. To the extent of my knowledge, this is the only game console that has a full keyboard layout on the face. And that's because Magnavox didn't want to advertise it as just a gaming system. To them, it was an entire gaming computer. The Alienware of its day. It wouldn't just play games, it would be an educational tool, teaching young kids things like math and letters, while also teaching older, more experienced players things like computer programming. It was a very ambitious system for its time. Of course, I'm positive that back then, like today, everybody only bought it to play the games. Another thing worth noting is that there were several versions of this console, because we obviously don't do that today. I currently own two, but basically the only differences between them is that one has the standard detachable controllers, and the other has everything wired directly into the system. So if those controllers ever broke, you were actually expected to take them apart and put a new one on. Another thing about the consoles is that they both use an old RF connector that's supposed to connect to a box and then to the TV. If yours is broken, like mine is, there's an alternative. Buy an adapter, plug the cord directly into the TV, and toss that box in the trash where it belongs. Unless your console is an even older model, like I used to own, where you have no choice but to use the box. But that's another story. So, now that that's out of the way, let's test out some games. First we have Alien Invaders Plus. Turning it on, you may notice that it looks very similar to another famous game made by a different company. In fact, most of the Odyssey 2's library is made up of clones, which to their credit differ from the original game, but are still recognizable as being ripped off from another game. That's because the Odyssey had very few third-party supporters, and they were basically forced to steal from popular games in order to compete with other consoles at the time. And this got them in a lot of trouble with developers, but we'll get into that later. So how's the game itself? Well, like Space Invaders, you pilot a small spaceship fighting off waves of aliens who are shooting at you. Unlike Space Invaders, this is about ten times harder! First of all, the aliens also have a barrier that deflects laser fire, so you have about half a second to shoot through the holes when they're exactly in the right place or you miss. Secondly, you can only fire one shot at a time, so every time you shoot at the aliens, you have to wait until the laser completely dissipates until you can fire another shot. 
thankfully, the aliens have the same thing, and you can even use your lasers to counter the shots, but if you shot a laser and it's still not off the screen, you're screwed. Third, there's this red spider thing who acts a lot like an alien from Galaga, in that he floats around the top of the screen firing lasers and will sometimes swoop down and make it easier for him to shoot you. And if you shoot him, he respawns! Fourth, these barriers that you're used to seeing in these games, they're actually your life capacity. Whenever you're shot, you turn into this little pixel guy and have to run to another one before you get shot again. And when you lose all three of them, which you will very quickly, then the game actually mocks you by having you just run back and forth until a laser finishes you off. And just to rub it in, the enemy also has a point counter that goes up whenever they win. Dude! Harsh! This is like that bully who holds your lunch just out of arm's reach, then smashes it and laughs in your face every single day of the third grade, keeping a tally of how many times he's done it just to make it worse. So next we have another space game, Cosmic Conflict. This is interesting. You have a first person's perspective of a pseudo 3D layout where you find and shoot down spaceships. It's also striving for a realistic feel where up moves you down and down moves you up and you need to shoot where the ship is going to be as opposed to where you have it targeted. You have a thousand seconds to shoot down 15 spaceships. Each shot costs you 10 seconds, and sometimes a TIE fighter shoots at you, and if you don't hit it in time, costs you 50 seconds. Yeah, that's seriously a TIE fighter. What's with these old games and ripping off Star Wars designs? This game's a lot more fun and playable than the other one, but it's still hard to aim and steer. When you destroy all 15, you get a message from Star Command that either says, Good work! Galaxy saved again! Or, Congratulations! You are promoted to Commodore! And what? Do I get my own luxury cruise ship? Do I get my own Saturday morning TV show? Does somebody knock on my door and present me with an ancient computer? I mean, come on! I get promoted and the game doesn't even have the courtesy to let me keep playing? Jeez, I'm running into some rude games in this video. Next up, Subchase. Pretty straightforward. It's a two-player game with the first player controlling the plane and the second player controlling the sub, and each player has three minutes to hit the other with as many missiles as possible. Hitting the opponent adds a point, hitting a boat loses one. It's actually really hard to hit. The plane and sub speed by at 100 miles an hour, and they barely slow down when you push the joystick the other way. But what's pretty cool is that you can steer the missile when you fire it, giving you a better chance of hitting the other. I also love the delay when both the missiles hit, like the planar sub goes, Ah, oh, wait, I've been hit. The game just freezes after three minutes, so all you get if you win are bragging rights. This is a cartridge with multiple games on it, so let's see what Armored Encounter is. You've got to be kidding me. It's combat! You know, combat for the Atari 2600? The game packaged with every Atari 2600 system? Combat, combat, with the tanks. I mean, they didn't even bother changing anything. It's freaking combat. A two player game where players drive their tanks at each other and shoot the other down? You've played combat? Then you've played Armored Assault. And I'll stick with the regular combat since that game includes planes and better graphics. Now let's play Blockout Breakdown. Looking at it, it looks like a straight port of Breakout. You know, where you bounce a ball against some blocks and try to clear them out. But actually, they're practically two completely different games. The concept is similar, bouncing a ball to clear blocks, but the goal in this game is to get your ball to the top of the screen in 90 seconds or less by smashing through four layers of blocks. But while you're trying to do that, Atari's ET cousins are repairing the layers to keep you from getting there. You can hit the blocks they're in to stop them temporarily, but they respawn very quickly after falling off the screen. And the ball travels really fast. It constantly moves faster than you can position the paddle. Thankfully, you're given infinite lives. It's just a matter of getting it done in the time limit. After you've won, or lost as the case will most of the time be, 
Then you're put in the defensive position, where now you're the bathroom signs trying to repair the walls. And you thought the breakout portion was hard? You have to use the joystick to move four different characters. The bottom moves the green, the middle moves the blue, the upper moves the yellow, and the button plus the middle moves the red. Each icon can replace one section of the layers before they have to move to the edge of the screen and recharge. If you can keep your opponent from reaching the top for 90 seconds, you win. But good luck. The breakdown game is basically the same thing, only you're trying to clear out as many blocks as possible in the time frame. So the game's not bad, it's just really hard. But now let's look at Bowling Basketball. Oh, I'm sorry, I pronounced it wrong. I forgot to mention that every game in the library has an exclamation mark at the end. So it's not Bowling Basketball, it's BOWLING BASKETBALL! First, the BOWLING game. Yeah, that's another thing about these consoles. They're never consistent when it comes to first player, second player ports. So you just gotta switch the controller ports until you get one that works. Anyway, the game. It's a joke. The ball travels along the bottom of the screen, and you need to hit the button when it's exactly in the right place. And once you get it going, you can tap the joystick to spin the ball in a different direction. But the main problem with this game is that the pins disappear when the ball rolls over them, making it impossible to roll a strike. And since there are no physics, most of your throws will either be spares or splits. By comparison, let's look at the Atari version. Not only does it have more graphics, but you move the ball and there's even a primitive physics program where some pins knock down others. A little better than this, don't you think? Now let's try BASKETBALL! Oh, good grief. You're two sprites giving the Nazi salute who never turn around or move their legs, and once one player has the ball, it's impossible for the other to grab it. Again, Atari got it right. Also, I hate to nitpick, but... Do you see the handles on these games? Why are they here? Did the company seriously go, oh, nobody's gonna get the game out just by grabbing at the top, we better put a handle on it. Don't you think that they could have removed the handle and saved money and given us, so oh, I don't know, a good bowling and basketball game? Or maybe they're there to keep on a key ring. Yep, you'll look pretty stylish lugging these games around like this. At least it's better than the Game Boy shoe. Oh, now we're getting into games I actually have cases for. First is Pachinko! So this is going to be like that Japanese pinball game? Well, I can't say I was expecting this. You're two of those little gremlins from the breakdown game, each carrying a little flipper to knock the ball into slots with different numbers to score more points than the other. Also, the balls change color and score points depending on who touches them, the grassy knoll randomizes the numbers, and the little blue guy walks back and forth, grabbing whatever balls come his way and returning them to the middle to be used again. If there's an actual pachinko cabinet like this, I'm on the next plane to Tokyo. Now here we have KC Munchkin! The game starts and... Gee, does this look familiar? You're a spherical being with a mouth that opens and closes when you move, you're traveling around a maze, you're collecting dots while avoiding ghosts, and if you chomp down on the flashing pellets, the ghosts turn purple and you can eat them. If you haven't figured it out yet, then maybe this will help. It's not exactly like Pac-Man. There's far fewer dots, they move around depending on how many you've gobbled down, the maze is a lot more fragmented, and the middle part rotates and spits out ghosts at random. But the game was so similar to Pac-Man that Atari sued Philips, the publisher, and won, forcing them to stop selling the game. And what did Philips do? They made a sequel to this game called Crazy Chase that has the character chomping down an Atari centipede. Burn! Also included is the ability to make and play your own levels. Yeah, by pushing P on the keyboard, you enter a programming area where you can create different mazes. 
Okay, the keyboard functions are hard to get used to, but for a system and game to have these? In 1981? This was state of the art! Kids these days with their G mods, their Happy Wheels, and their Unity engines. Now this is where it's at. Coming to the end here, let's look at the three pack. First game, Speedway! Sort of like Grand Prix or Speedway for the Atari. See how far you can go in two minutes. I gotta admit, it's too slow though. Once you have the pattern down, you can easily reach two minutes with little to no problem. Let's try adjusting the skill level. Okay, that's better. Second game, Spin Out! Another racing game, this time like Indy 500 for Atari. Two player only, see who can complete three or 15 laps first. Third game, Crypto Logic! Instead of a racing game, this one's a word scrambler puzzle. The first player enters a word, and the second player tries to figure it out with as few mistakes as possible. How is it that this is probably the simplest game we've seen so far, yet it's one of the most fun? There, figure that one out. Also, the game proudly boasts that it can be used as a limited blackboard. Yeah, just imagine your 6th grade teacher writing out math problems on this. Finally, let's look at Pickaxe Pete! It's a very simple survival platformer. You're one of the stick people from the Blair Witch, and you walk around with a pickaxe smashing all the boulders in your way. But according to the instructions, the guy swings his pickaxe so hard that it breaks. So then you need to dodge the boulders in your way until you manage to get a new pickaxe. Yeah, let's see Indiana Jones do that. Just jump over the boulder next time. Sometimes you also get a key that takes you to, I guess, the next level. You have infinite lives, but your score resets when you die, so it's about getting as high a score as you can without dying. Overall, not too bad of a game, but not something I'd choose to play. So, that was the Magnavox Odyssey 2. That's not all the games for it, but I wanted to give you a tour of just what it has and what it's capable of. So, in a battle between this and, say, the Atari 2600, which one would win? That's easy. The ColecoVision. And yeah, we'll talk about this in the future. But in all seriousness, I'm not really impressed with this system. It had a lot of potential, yes, and they worked hard to differentiate this system from others at the time, but I feel like they put more into the design of the console than the games. Most of them are just mediocre clones, the color scheme is lacking, they're surprisingly even simpler than an Atari game, and I feel like a lot more could have been put into them to make them fun and memorable. Consoles like the Atari, Intellivision, and ColecoVision tried to give their games personality. Like they knew they didn't have much space to work with, so they wanted the atmosphere to stand out and present a unique experience. The Odyssey 2, on the other hand, feels like it's just one of those multi-game CD-ROMs that pop up everywhere. The concepts might be the same, but there's significantly less work and heart put into them. There are a few gems, but overall, I can understand why the Odyssey 2 didn't do as well as the other systems at the time. We're probably not going to come back to this system, but it was still a fun learning experience. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and thanks for watching. Stop! I am the king! Look, I'll get to your games when I can. I'm not even doing a VCR board game this week, so could you please just leave? Silence! Bennett. I am here to remind you why you have done this video in the first place. Uh, yeah, because I found this system at a thrift store and thought it'd be fun to play. And these games proved me wrong, so I'm just gonna... Do I need to spell it out for you? You forgot the things that came with everything else. The things that have no reason to exist. But I did Alien Invaders Plus, Armored Encounter, the bowling game, and the three pack, so that just leaves me with... Oh... Exactly. Now finish the review. Oh, uh, well, so tune in next week when we look at the things that I'm surprised even exist. Until then, thanks for watching. No, you maggot! Do the games now! Look, 
I've been reviewing the system for 20 minutes. I'm tired, they're tired, I'll get to it next week. Then why you did the episode in the first place? You can't deny why you made it. This is why you're not getting to my games yet. You are a lazy internet reviewer. You push the good stuff down in favor of the junk you discover. When are you planning to review the- Next week! Odyssey. Video game fun. Computer keyboard challenge. The entrance to an alternate world of fire-breathing dragons. Hard-hitting sluggers. Arcade wizards. Outer space wizards. More than 40 games in all. Odyssey. The excitement of a game. The mind of a computer. All for the price of an ordinary video game. Odyssey. Seriously, forks. And I say that right?